thank you, worship team, for the wonderful songs. And we thank God for a new opportunity to get together and hear his word. I thank God for the times that we learned from Hebrews, and we will continue in the book of Hebrews in the series that we have started a while ago, which is Faith and Turning Back series. And today we're going to talk about number 20. The book of Hebrews is easily divided into 10 chapters, a chapter and two other chapters. The first chapter of Hebrews talks about Jesus being fully God, proves with absolute truth that leaves no doubt and uses quotes from the Old Testament that Jesus is God and he is God's word. He is God himself appearing in the flesh. Chapter 2 proves Jesus Christ was fully human, flesh and blood. Then we look at chapter 3, 7 and 8. It proves Jesus is very unique, different from anyone who preceded him, whether it was Joshua, Moses, Aaron. Chapters 9 and 10 proves he is the true sacrifice and the only sacrifice desired by God and without him there is no salvation or eternal life or way to face God. In chapter 11 it's practical examples of people who lived the faith and not turning away. Hebrews 12 to 13 are practical examples of how we can live this faith as others lived. The verse we are looking at tonight is Hebrews 10, 29. How much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God. It sums up the 10 chapters before. And people don't really like to hear this judgment. They like to see the filter of love. Uh, they don't want to hear about judgment and hell and punishment. And some people will say that there, the God of the Old Testament is harsh, but the God of the New Testament is kind and wonderful. But I assure you, it is the sea is the same God. Nothing changed. And many preachers these days don't talk about judgment or punishment or hell. And they just want to talk about, you know, all the nice soothing things from God. Now, this God that was kind enough and merciful enough that and offered his son to shed his blood and make salvation available to all mankind is the same God who will judge those who reject, deny, and trample his son. We are in Hebrews 10. And when we look at Hebrews 10, starting verse 19, we look at encouragement, incitement, and also a warning. Perhaps in this book of Hebrews, we see the most severe warnings of turning back and trampling the Son of God. The title of the slide I ha have 
on the overhead is Christ the mediator and the intercessor. And it starts off by saying, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, because in the Old Testament, no one could enter the Holy of Holies. No one can come near it except for the high priest. He would walk in once a year and offer sacrifice for the salvation uh, of the sins. But when Jesus came, Jesus tore that curtain. And now we don't have this division anymore. And we can approach God the Father only through Jesus. And without Jesus, no one can approach God the Father. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way. Then we look at verse 20. By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So Christ is our mediator. He is the only way that we can approach God. And the role of Jesus Christ did not stop by dying on the cross and offering his body as a sacrifice so that he can tear the curtain, the veil that separated us from God. Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He continues with us throughout the way until we are with him in glory. Verse 21 says, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we have confidence in faith, the faith that the Son of God died to redeem us and to pay for our sins. And no one can have forgiveness of sins unless their heart is sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And that is how our conscience changes from an evil conscience to a clean conscience. Because we become holy in Christ. And how do we have bodies that are washed pure with water? We wash our bodies with the word of God. The Bible is the word of God and we need to read God's word daily so we are cleansed daily the more we read God's word the cleaner we get and we can start understanding who is Christ and who is man and what Christ has done for us and that is the hope, the hope we have. And the hope is eternal life in Christ. Because you know who promised? God himself promised. And God is faithful and just. So we draw near, we hold tight to the hope we affirm without wavering and now we have affirmation we have words of confidence that no one can come and shake our faith or make us doubt and we have to encourage one another and we have to hold 
fast that confession of hope without wavering and consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking being together pay attention to verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together I want to warn you one of the first signs of drawing back is forsaking or neglecting meeting with other believers. You need to be in the company of believers because we are the body of Christ and Christ is the head of that body. When we meet together and we have communion together, we worship together, this is not something new because we encourage one another, we preach for one another, we teach one another and we cannot live by ourselves. And that is so important. As the day nears, the day is approaching. What day is that? When Jesus comes back. When sin increases and love decreases, we can easily fall into sin. When we have problems in life, when we are persecuted, we need one another. We need to know that we have hope and to affirm each other. When we look at verse 26 and 27, there is encouragement and there is warning. It's almost like a sandwich. We have encouragement at the beginning, encouragement at the end, and in between there is a warning and cautioning. And there is no gospel that does not include this warning. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 17 that their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. We know that Jesus Christ took our sins away. And in verse 18, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering of sin. However, if someone chooses to willfully sin, deliberately sin, after knowing what Christ has done, Verse 26 says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Sin that is deliberate is sin that is very knowing, well aware that it's a sin, and the person is doing it by choice. If we choose to ignore the truth that we learned and continue in sin, then there is no remission of that sin. And the Bible says those who have believed for a while and 
in verse 27 it says but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries so there is only a terrible expectation of God's judgment if we willfully sin and a raging fire that will consume those who sin deliberately and willfully. This raging fire is not something new. When we look at the Old Testament, God describes himself as a jealous God. And he says, I'm a holy God. And in Hebrews 12, our God is a consuming fire. We have been given those clearly in the Bible. But some people choose to ignore who God is or put it away or cover it or walk away from it but this is who God is he is a jealous God he is a holy God and he is a consuming fire when we look at 2nd Peter chapter 2 in verse 20 it says if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and again entangled in it and our and are overcome so these people have escaped corruption of the world they know the Lord and Savior but again get entangled in the world and are overcome by it, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. And this is the person who knew the truth. He knows the price Jesus paid and chooses willfully to sin. In verse 22, the Apostle Peter continues, Of them, the, proverb, the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Because those people are not believers. A believer has a new nature. But those people that turn back, those people that turn away, their nature never changed changed a dog is a dog so the dog returns to its vomit and the sow the nature of a sow is to wallow in the mud even though it was washed can a believer perish no a believer cannot perish the bible teaches that a believer will not perish but it also teaches that a real believer would not live in corruption does not live in sin does not put up a sign saying I am saved and goes about doing whatever he pleases now when we go back to Hebrews 10 and we look at verse 28 there is a comparison 
The writer of Hebrews says, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And this is coming from Deuteronomy, the Old Testament. And he continues to say of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be though worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? We need to stop here for a minute. Peter said that a person who believed and turned back is worse off at the end than at the beginning. It would have been better to have not even known. If we look at the Old Testament and someone would sin and reject Moses' law, they would be stoned to death. There was no forgiveness. There was no tolerance for sin. And now, we look at us compared to people in the Old Testament that sinned and did not obey the law. They would have been stoned to death but for us, we have a bigger punishment. We have a worse punishment. Because God had offered his son as a sacrifice for us. And when we trample the son, the Bible says, those who trample the son counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insult the spirit of grace. Today, this morning, I went and I read a statement of faith of one of the largest sections of churches in, in North America. It says, we believe in Jesus, the first begotten son, not the only begotten son. And they are declaring that. The Bible says Jesus is the only begotten son. But they are saying he is the oldest son. And that is where the warning is. How much worse punishment do you suppose he will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? This is a person that that said that the Son is not the only Son of God, that Jesus is not the only son and that is trampling the son and that person disdained the Holy Spirit disdained Christ and what he has done for us they have disrespected God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the Father sent the Son, the Son willfully, willingly came and died for our sins, and the Holy Spirit testified for that sacrifice so the Trinity was present in the cross the Trinity 
was there when Jesus died for us. God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. How is God going to judge those who trample the Son? The Bible tells us, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is what God says. Some people say, no, 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 God is kind. He is not a God of vengeance. I didn't say it. This is God's word. Is this in the Old Testament? It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Anyone who has rejected Moses' laws dies without mercy. Can you imagine those who reject God's son? I want you to pay attention. No one can touch God the Father. But guess who they can touch and abuse and reject? It's God the Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus says, whoever honors me, honors the Father. And whoever does not honor me, doesn't honor the Father. Because Jesus in the flesh is the one who people reject. And the Bible tells us it is dreadful. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I want you to pay attention to verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I searched, by the way, it's not in the Old Testament. This is a verse only in the New Testament. So I want you to pay attention that God will judge. And it is a fearful thing to fall into his hands. And God punishes us according to how much we know. People in the Old Testament knew little, and they are judged for the little they knew. We know a lot more now, and that comes with responsibility. So that judgment will be even a harsher judgment. The responsibility we have is according to how much knowledge we have received. The writer of Hebrews is probably thinking of Jesus and what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, when he told his disciples, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. This is Jesus speaking. He is talking to his disciples. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Yes, I tell you, this is who you should fear. And that's why the Apostle Paul always says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God is merciful. And because of his mercy for us, he sent his son to die for us. But whoever rejects what God has done by sending his son to die for us will be judged. In the book of John, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the only begotten son, because God has only one son. 
Yeah, we are the children of God. But we are not the son of God. So God was not merciful on his own son. But out of his mercy for us, he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did God send his son? Because he doesn't want us to perish. And he's giving us this gift for everyone. And whoever does not believe in him is not going to have eternal life. And when you look at verse 17, you will see that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but pay attention, but he who does not believe is condemned already. This is a present tense because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Whoever receives the Son, he has eternal life, starting right away, immediately, from here on earth. No one tells Jesus, wait, I have to think about it. I have to decide what I want. When you accept Jesus and what is, he has done on the cross, there is no condemnation now. You will not be condemned now. But whoever rejects the son is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And that is present tense. The condemnation starts here and now, just as eternal life starts here and now. If we reject the Son and we don't believe, the only son, not the first son, the only son. He's not the first son. He's the only begotten son. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hands. So God gave judgment to his son because the son is the one who will give life or take it away. If you present yourself as a sacrifice and you shed your blood, you have the right to judge. That's what Jesus did. Whoever believes in the Son, Jesus Christ, has everlasting life. And he who does not believe, the Son shall not see, in the Son shall not see life. So it's not about who stole, who lied, who killed, who didn't go to church. The one who's going to be condemned, the one is, who's going to be condemned is the one who does not believe in the name of the only son. There is no other choice. You either believe or you don't believe. There is no popularity here there is no gray area there is no I'm gonna cheer for the best play you either believe or you don't believe and sadly some people are teaching that there is no hell and there is only eternal death 
if you reject the Son of God. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say there is going to be a detachment or absence of God. There is going to be wrath and there is going to be hell in judgment. God gave love, eternal love. And he gave grace and he gave his son. But if we reject what God gave, we have only wrath, God's wrath to deal with. The wrath of God is not something to be taken lightly. I am going to read from Second Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. It says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. So there, there will be punishment. The punishment is with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. On the day He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Sadly, many churches are not teaching this these days. They don't want to teach the wrath of God. They don't want to teach punishment. They don't want to teach hell. Finally, we are going to look at the encouragement. We're going to look at God's will for us. God's will is faith. Not drawing back. God's will is faith, not condemnation. God wants everyone to believe. He wants salvation for everyone. And he wants everyone to believe. Verse 32 says, But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Partly while you were suffering, so there is a, a price to pay. There is suffering. And Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. And there is a wide door and a narrow road. And the narrow road is full of trouble and hardship. But the wide road is easy. But it does not lead to eternal life. And many people give up the hardship and the narrow road and would rather take the wide road. He continues to say, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions to those who were so treated, for you had compassion on me because he was in chains. Therefore, don't cast away your confidence which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God you may receive the promise. 
we are in a race and in the end there is a reward but some people run the race and they get very tired just before the fish the finishing line and give up it's like a soldier who is fighting a good war but at the big at the end is very tired and throws away his weapon don't do that now we need to continue for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of god you may receive the promise for yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry and he will reward you for your endurance and he will not be delayed and when jesus comes there is a reward and the reward is for both sides it's for those who believed and those who did not when we look at romans 2 4 to 8 it says or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness forbearance and patience not realizing that god's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance god's judgment is real you will give account to your wrong deeds and you will bear the wrath of god it's two folds in verse 5 it says but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of god's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed god will repay each person according to what they have done to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory honor and immortality he will give eternal life but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil there will be wrath and anger there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil so i want you to know that there is a reward for each side those who believe and those who reject christ and then hebrews 10 is the verse that we have continued studying for a number of months now now that just shall live by faith but if anyone draws back my soul has no pleasure in him that faith in what jesus has done for us but we are not of those who draw back to perdition but of those who believe to the saving of the soul so we need to approach god with confidence but we are not of those who draw back to perdition but to those who believe to the saving of the soul 
And in the next chapter, Hebrews 11, we are going to look at the practical life of a believer and how they showed and practiced that faith, how they lived that faith. I am concluding and I am finishing up by Hebrews 10.38 and it's actually from Habakkuk as well. Now the just shall live by faith. God wants us to live a life of faith and to continue daily living this life of faith. I am going to ask the worship team to come up and sing a song for us. We are all humans, we are all flesh and blood, and we are all subject to temptation, but we need to live the life of faith. If anyone denies God by word, action, teaching, or the way of life, that person will have to deal with God's wrath and judgment and punishment. These people that those words are written for are people that believed. They are people that thought that they have faith. Life is not about preaching. It is about a heart cleansed by the blood of Christ, a clean conscience, a pure life that is lived in fear and holiness. And I want you to think of these words. God has given us life and judgment. And you need to choose. And faith is not ambiguous. It's faith in his son that took on flesh, lived among us, was crucified, died, was buried, and was resurrected. He was raised to heaven, and he is coming back to judge us, to judge everyone. I want you to listen to this song. Use it as a prayer. And be careful, as Corinthians says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful you don't fall. Just as I am, I come to you, Lord. You said, Draw near to me. I am coming and drawing near to you, God. O Lamb of God. Lord, I come to you as a sinner. Let the blood of Jesus wash my sin away. 
I am coming to you to cleanse me, O Lamb of God. I come to you, generous and loving God. You are a rich God that is willing to give in the name of the precious Lamb of God. I come to you, God, the one who does not deserve anything because of my sin, but in Christ I can come to you. You are the one who heals the sick. You are the one who satisfies and quenches the, thir the thirst for you, O Lamb of God. I come to you, Lord. There is no righteousness in me. I come to you in the name of the one who died for my sins, the one who redeemed me, the one who sacrificed himself for me. And I ask you for forgiveness, O Lamb of God. Father God, I thank you for the amazing sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for giving us a way out of our sin. Thank you for what you have done on the cross. God appearing in the flesh an amazing sacrifice to wipe my sins away and our sins away. I ask you, Lord, that no one fails and no one turns away but to have confidence in what you have done for us and to continue in the hope that you have given us the value in your blood and sacrifice. Please help our weakness and our inability and fill us with confidence and hope. In Jesus' name, Amen.